Thank you very much for the invitation and for this very warm welcome. Uh, I'm very honored and privileged to be here to join you today on such a wonderful day. Since I was asked to speak to you, I've been thinking about similar experiences that I've had occasions when I was in the audience uh, in your shoes. And my thoughts return uh, to a day many years ago at Cairo University in Egypt uh, where I was sitting in a stifling hot auditorium waiting to receive my medical uh, school diploma. I don't really remember if there were any speeches. I don't really remember who was sitting on either side of me. I do remember one thing though. I could not wait for that ceremony to end. <laughs> I was sitting on the edge of my seat, a sprinter poised for the start of the race. Little did I know that memories of those wonderful student years would stay with me for many, many years to come. Little did I know also how these formative years in Egypt uh, would shape my approach and to the challenges to come. And little did I know that this would not be a sprint, but rather a very long marathon. It is a convention, almost a cliche, uh, to tell graduating students to follow their dreams. And so it's quite easy to dismiss this as verbiage, um, to dust, uh, dust it off for the occasion, not to be taken seriously. But the essence, the core of the message holds. Do you have dreams and ideas already today? Will you have those dreams later? And when you do, will you listen to those dreams, embrace them? Will you, do, will you have the fortitude to pursue them? Because fortitude you will need. Great, great ideas often seem implausible. Smart colleagues will try to persuade you and give apparent cogent reasons why these ideas are infeasible, maybe even reckless. Rather than encountering a world that encourages you to dream big, you may find yourself mired in a culture of no. One where fear of failure means that great ideas don't even get a try. You will have to decide, sometimes on a daily basis, whether to listen to the naysayers from whom you may learn, and when instead to believe in your own vision and have the fortitude to push forward. I will tell you a little, about, a little about my own story and how I've used my background to guide me as I pursued my own path. In reality, looking back, I can definitively say that the HIV AIDS epidemic has defined my professional life. The numbers are simply numbing. Currently, about 20, 33 million individuals with HIV are living in the world, two-thirds of them in Africa, a million right here in the United States, a hidden and forgotten epidemic. To put this in perspective, the number of people with HIV in the US is about twice the population of the city of Boston. Just this past year, there were two million deaths globally due to HIV, and about 15 million children have lost one or both of their parents due to this disease. And just this past year, almost three million people got newly infected Oh, about half a million children. Every single day, there are about 7,000 individuals around the world who get HIV infected. That's every single day, 7,000 individuals. These numbers are overwhelming. What can one possibly do about these numbers and this situation? In the early years of this past decade, I remember walking down the hall of a rambling public hospital in South Africa Bed after bed were occupied by desperately ill young people with sunken faces, ashen skin, and glistening eyes that stared silently at me, a visitor. Between the beds, others lay on thin mattresses on the floor in very similar shape, women, men, and children. On that visit, the deathly silence of the wards affected me strongly. How could this silence be in Africa, a continent that to me always buzzed with the cadence of melodious languages and vibrant music. All I could think of at that time was that this did not have to be so. It just did not have to be so. We in wealthy countries by the mid-1990s already knew how to prevent transmission from a pregnant woman to her baby. We knew how to treat people with HIV AIDS. We had the cocktail of effective medicines that could save lives. But unfortunately, these medicines were not available to the many millions who desperately needed them in poor countries. I became determined that something must be done to remedy the situation. 
But in reality, it was not easy. Again and again, we heard the word no. No, the medicines were too expensive and had too many side effects. No, poor people in Africa would never take the medicines on a daily basis, and so resistant strains of virus would run rampant around the world. No, it would not be possible to implement because healthcare workers were scarce, and even those healthcare workers that were around and available could not possibly learn to take care of this complicated condition. No, there were no laboratories, no roads, and only weak health systems. No, there's rampant corruption. No, I was told no one would show up due to the high levels of stigma in these societies. In fact, the word misguided was used to describe the plans that I and my colleagues began to propose and work on. Yet, it was simply wrong to deprive people of something that could prevent or alleviate their suffering. Over the past few years, with support from colleagues and partnership with many people around the world, we've been able to establish models of comprehensive HIV prevention, care, and treatment that build on the intrinsic commitment and the innovative spirit so evident in the countries where we work. With a family-focused approach, a commitment to building in-country capacity, and a vision for quality and excellence, these programs have brought life-saving care and treatment to close to a million individuals in Africa. Now, how was this accomplished in such a short period of time? The momentum came from a sense of urgency and passion on the ground. I think back to a visit to a rural clinic a few years ago. A proud and eager nurse feverishly showed me copies of training certificates that she had just accumulated. This, she asserted, was evidence of the readiness, her readiness to treat HIV. She had written down pages and pages of names of people from her community that she knew needed treatment urgently. She kept saying to me again and again, we're ready, we're ready. People like this nurse were not waiting for fancy buildings or beautiful furniture. They understood deeply that this was an emergency. HIV was killing their families, their friends, and their communities. They passionately wanted to do something about it. They would not take no for an answer. It was the people on the ground, whether leaders in the Ministry of Health or a lone health worker in a one-room health post in a remote village who were most eager to succeed. Today, if you drive down a bumpy road in a remote rural district in Mozambique or Rwanda, you might come across a crowd of people outside the health center. Some are sitting on benches with babies strapped to their bellies. Others are scattered in the yard, sitting on the grass in the sun, waiting their turn to be seen. Inside, there's a welcome din. There is no silence anymore. A welcome din with more people standing and sitting, some crowding around nurses as they weigh babies, others speaking quietly with counselors regarding their newly prescribed medicines. At the other end of the clinic are very proud clerks pulling charts from neatly organized shelves. And bustling between all are peer educators, themselves people with HIV, who are working to help others like themselves. You may want to stop one of those peer educators to ask them about their story and their work. The story often begins in a hospital bed, similar to the situation I described to you earlier. You may hear a tale of abandonment by family, then a precious chance offered for treatment, followed by recovery, and an opportunity provided to become a peer educator. You're likely to witness deep commitment and pride and knowledge and wisdom. That peer educator may share with you how she takes a newly diagnosed pregnant woman by the hand, providing her with comfort, information, and hope, how she escorts this woman to where she can get care for herself and protection for her baby. You might even find yourself trekking up a narrow dirt path in the hills with another peer educator as he makes a home visit to check on someone who didn't show up for clinic. In the voices and stories of these peer educators, you'll hear the sound of triumph over adversity of determination and of commitment. For all the no's we heard in the past, all you have to do is meet one of these individuals to realize what is possible. It is in these settings that people I meet in Africa often say to me, ah, things must be so different in New York. I smile and tell them there are really more similarities than differences between peoples. In fact, in the early years of the epidemic in Harlem, I distinctly remember hearing again and again the word no. No, poor people were not worthy of services. No, gay men deserve to get HIV infection and do not deserve services or resources. No, drug users are irresponsible and will sell their medicines on the streets. 
No poor women with HIV should not keep their babies. No one could not be able to do research in these settings. But despite these naysayers, we carefully listened to our patients as they shared with us their struggles and needs. And step by step, we put together the mosaic of services that shaped the comprehensive HIV program that was built at Harlem Hospital, one of the first in this nation. And a program that included many of the same principles that have guided our work in Africa. It was also in Harlem that I first realized the power of persons with HIV. I clearly remember the day a young woman that I was taking care of who really shocked me. She told me that HIV was the best thing that ever happened to her. She could see both shock and surprise on my face. How could that possibly be, I wondered. She went on to tell me how HIV brought purpose to her life, helped her overcome years of addiction and despair, gave her the strength to find her long lost children to recreate her family, HIV motivated her to get her GED and go on to college. She did not take no for an answer. It was that moment that spurred me to establish the first peer program in Harlem years before the efforts in Africa. Yet, our work in confronting HIV and AIDS is far from done. There's a tremendous misconception that the emergency is over, that the epidemic in, in our midst in the US does not exist, that we have vanquished it. In addition, there's always the impetus to move on to other issues. And this threatens to destroy the achievements to date and to do millions to a terrible fate. Thus, we can't rest on our laurels. The struggle must continue and our work must go on. We simply cannot take no for an answer. It has been years since those early days in Egypt where I started my story. Looking back, Maybe it was the indelible mark of growing up in a poor country that motivated my journeys in Harlem and in Africa. Maybe it was witnessing the multitude of misfortunes that befell people, the fragility of life, the many diseases that prevailed that we so rarely see today in this country. Friends with polio, cousins with tuberculosis, my friend next door who developed meningitis and died, People who had so little but somehow overcame adversity every day despite all the odds. You each have your own unique experiences that you will build on. Look back and seek your motivations and your sources of strength. Then stride ahead and be ready to move mountains. Along the way, be humble, be kind, be generous. That will be a lasting legacy. Listen carefully before you act, reflect, do not judge unjustly. Be patient, let others find the answers, inform and guide, but step back and let others lead. And remember, whether your path takes you to Harlem or to Harare, Zimbabwe, or even if you stay right here in Boston, never succumb to the culture of no. Believe in your wisdom and have the personal strength to push forward with your own ideas, you will make a difference. Congratulations and thank you.